Living the Faith Podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com. This is the Living the Faith Show, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, and we are here in studio, coming at you from the heart of America, Joe and Mike, where today we're hosting a very, very special show with a distinguished professor of psychology from Steubenville University, uh, from Franciscan in Steubenville. This is Dr. Samut. Doctor, how are you, sir? Hello. I'm well, thank you. How are you? Not bad, not bad. We're uh, very blessed to have you on the show and uh, supportive of your work. Um, So let's, let's dive into that. First of all, you are Maltese. Is that correct? That's. That is correct. Yes, I was born in Malta. Born in Malta. And you made your way to Steubenville, Ohio. Yes, a very long way, actually. I actually uh, migrated to Australia when I was 12. My parents moved to Australia. Um, So this was in the 1980s. We had a socialist government there that was uh, bordering, in a way, on being communist and persecuting the church as well. Um, And uh, I think it came to a point where my father said, you know, he doesn't want to bring up uh, family in that kind of environment, yeah. although my father was outspoken himself. Yeah. Um, and we migrated to Australia and we lived in Melbourne and the Melbourne area. We didn't live in Melbourne. We lived just outside of the Melbourne mm. area. Um, and I spent another 12 years there. So I graduated high school and, uh, university is, I actually, my first degree is pharmacy. Pharmacy. Um, so I graduated as a pharmacist in from the Victorian College of Pharmacy, which uh-huh. is affiliated with Monash University in Australia. And then I moved back to, Mo- was married. I met my wife in Australia, was married. Uh, we moved to Malta. There was a change in government and I did my PhD yeah. in behavioral neuroscience in Malta. Then I moved to Albany, New York. Um, and I worked at the Albany Med, uh, 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 Albany Medical Center mm. conducting research. Okay. And from there to the Chicago Medical School in North Chicago, and then to Stephenville. So it's been a long step after step, but a long way, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. You know, um, yeah, it sounds like your dad was a very good steward of the family and um, and believed what Margaret Thatcher would always say about socialism. <laughs> the problem with socialism is you end up running out of other people's money at some point. So, <laughs> All right. Oh, wait. wait. Very My true. wife can tell you about that. You said that you met your wife in Australia, Doctor? Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, she is also of Maltese okay. uh, descent. Her parents moved to Australia earlier than my parents did. In their, in their case, they moved to Australia. Uh, her father was looking for a job, basically. Mm. Malta's a very, very small island. It is, but y'all, y'all seem about, to get around. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I got to I got to talk to you a little bit before the show. We found out we have one thing in common that we both met our wives in Australia, um, but then also it's funny that you that that this should uh, that this should happen. But I have a brother in law who is Maltese as well. He married one of my wife's sisters. I guess that doesn't make him my brother in law, but you get my my drift. But yeah, yeah it, like you say, you, y'all get around. It's kind of like you, the, the Maltese. You just, yeah. you, especially in Australia, it seems like there's a quite a large contingent actually. Well, you're a seafaring people, doctor. Yeah, they, <laughs> you're sorry. a seafaring people. <laughs> oh yes, they say the population overseas of Maltese of Maltese migrants is actually greater than the population in in Malta, which wouldn't surprise me. I mean, like I said, it's a very small island, and if people leave for looking for a job. Um, Australia was a, a common place mm-hmm. to go, uh, Toronto, Canada, and I believe New York wow. as well. That's okay, amazing. so behavioral neuroscience, that sounds very smart. Uh, what are we talking about? What? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this is your PhD, right? <laughs> yes, yes. You give me too much yes. credit. Um, no, uh, well... With regards to the smartness aspect, I have to say that with every aspect that you investigate in research, you only find out how much you don't yeah. know rather than how much you do know. Yes. Um, so behavioral neuroscience is a field of neuroscience that seeks to integrate behavior as well as what is going on in the mm-hmm. brain at the neurophysiological and neurochemical level. So it, we're interested not just in the activity that is taking place in the brain, but also in the 
uh, how does that activity result in behavior? So we're not investigating p in uh, matter in a petri dish. Okay. We're investigating in a whole animal. So we use what's called animal models for our investigations, and we we seek to investigate. Uh, aspects of human behavior that we can potentially investigate in animals. Okay, and w when you say animal models, are you most l likely referring to rats, or is there some other animal? Well, there are many types of animal models. The most common one are rats, rats, mice, uh, fish. Some people use fruit flies. Mm -hmm. um, some people use monkeys. Those are rare. Uh, there's a lot of regulations in that regard, because there's a lot of animal ethics that are obviously, you can imagine, involved uh, in, in this. So, yeah, as, as a behavioral neuroscientist, I seek to bring in behavior and neuroscience together in order to be able to make some sort of a conclusion of what could potentially be happening in humans. With regards to the definition of animal models, these are not um, animals strutting on stage so uh, mm -hmm. when we talk about an animal model, we're referring to uh, an animal that is that can mimic uh, a, a, a human condition. So, for example, we have animal models of cancer, animal models of schizophrenia, uh -huh. animal models of depression, animal models of uh, uh, drug abuse. Uh -huh. um, and the reason why we're able to do this is because of the similarity that exists in the wiring of the brain and the behavioral consequences of okay it. so these so, these rats you know, are not strutting yeah, on the catwalk for us they're not fashion forward rats <laughs> no they're not, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay how similar are the brains i guess physiologically speaking how similar are they to those of humans there's a lot of similarity uh the the, the brain if i had to summarize the brain it would pretty much be the upper brain, which is involved in the executive function. It's the CEO. Let's call it the CEO. And then you have the lower brain, which is involved in survival behaviors, yeah. uh, reward, motivation, those kinds of aspects. Um, so that aspect is very similar between animals and humans. The difference, the aspect that is different, well, there's several. But the aspect that is different is that our cortex, our CEO, mm -hmm. is significantly larger. Additionally, we also, as humans, have the capacity to uh, uh, um, we have the spiritual aspect. You know, the, from, from a religious perspective, we know that we're created in the likeness, image and likeness of God. And obviously, this aspect is, does not, we don't see that aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, I work at a Catholic university. My rats are neither baptized nor catechized, even though I just had the, the lab blessed a few days ago. Not but a bad that idea. Has absolutely <laughs> the, the intention wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> the form and the matter were, but yeah. But <laughs> oh boy. So I guess you get the idea yeah. that there is a lot of similarity at the physiological okay. level. Uh, but then there's there's aspects that become significantly different at the human level in our ability to uh, weigh and reflect what we are seeing, what we are doing, and change our behaviors. Okay. An animal only has a more primitive aspect. Mm. So it, it, on, on that particular point, we've talked on previous shows uh, talking about even just the rearing, the rearing of children and, ha and how this relates to the, the animal uh, aspect of man versus the intellectual um, and I think that kind of gets a little bit hairy, especially when you're talking about the brain. Mm -hmm. What separates, what, 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 what functions of the brain are separate from those that serve the intellect? And I'm sure that there's a little bit of mystery around that. But is there, is there a way that we can understand that separation when you're studying these things, especially in the very specific research that you're doing? I think the simple answer I can really give to that is an aspect of humility knowing what your limits are. Mm. I mean, so for example, if I am, as I have in the past, my area of expertise has been looking at this upper brain, lower brain interaction in uh, models of schizophrenia, drug abuse, Parkinson's disease and depression. But knowing what your limit is, knowing that you, you, you know, your, your limit is the physiology there. You've got to be careful when you're extrapolating to a human, you can say that this potentially 
and, mm, and it's all mm. in the wording. Mm. This potentially reflects what may be taking place in the human brain. So, for example, depression. You know, yes, we know that depression can be associated with a spiritual aspect, but depression is also very much so associated with physiological changes that take place that can actually, uh, uh, you know, affect human behavior. Mm -hmm. There's things that are going on in the brain, and this is why sometimes medicine uh, is necessary. Uh, but is, it's interesting, actually, to look at the scientific literature, because what one finds is that medicine plus spirituality actually have more beneficial outcomes than potentially either on their own. Um, so I, I, I guess humility is really the answer. Sure. Knowing what your line is. Sure. So so what you're saying is, like, if we were to say, for example, that a, a dog is sad, would we yeah. say that? It, there, there's an intellectual sadness, and then there is a, a, a an effect that happens in the brain that is different. Physiological Physio sadness. Physiological in a way, sadness. If you want okay. To call it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's measurable. Yeah. In a in a in the brain. Is that measurable? Yeah. Yeah. It is measurable because we can measure neurotransmitters that are released. You probably heard in secular media. You know, you'll hear about uh, uh, dopamine. You, you may mm -hmm. have heard of dopamine or mm -hmm. the reward center. You mm -hmm. hear people talk about the reward center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, this is measurable um, because, like in humans, animals have a lower brain and an upper brain, and the lower brain needs to be controlled. If you don't mind, I can give you an example. Sure. Um, so, for example, if, you, um, if you're growing a garden, you know, you hear about many people who grow gardens who will say, I'm going to put some, maybe an owl out there or some sort of a, an animal that scares uh, the rabbits that come and s steal my vegetables. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you keep that, that uh, dummy out there, that uh, model of an owl out there, ultimately the rabbit, if you don't move it around, the rabbit is going to realize, you know, this is not a real thing. It's not going to do anything to me. Okay, it's not at the level of intellect and, and thinking that I'm describing at at the moment, but uh, the rabbit basically realizes that this stimulus, this negative, scary stimulus, is not really changing anything. Uh, it is not is not doing anything. It's not gonna harm mm. it, and it will continue pestering your garden, eating your vegetables. So there is this upper brain, lower brain control that takes place in an animal, but obviously it is not at the level. Of, uh, of what you would see in, in a human. I mean, you know, when I was investigating drugs of abuse, I never had any rats come up to me and say, you know, would you kindly stop administering the cocaine because it's really destroying my family. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> right. Consequences. They were too busy. They were too busy on the catwalk. Right. <laughs> These rats. Uh, All right. So humans have that capacity, yeah. however. Yeah, they sure. do. Okay, this is the point of the show where we're going to give the parental warning because we are going to be talking about the pro-life issue, and I want Dr. Samut to be free to use whatever scientific terminology uh, is appropriate. So at this point in the show and going forward, we are, will be discussing the pro-life issue. If your children are in the room and if you're sensitive to this, now would be the time to watch the show by yourself. Okay, doctor. Um, Tell us a little bit about your current research. So with my background, as I described earlier, yeah. uh, when I came to Franciscan, um, you know, I, I did not leave research because I didn't like research. I love research. It's my passion. Um, but I, 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 if I may just say this as an introduction to this of why, because it does relate, um, I, when I came to Franciscan, I had been looking at my previous place of work at possibilities of being able to share my, my faith within science, because I do not believe that there is any contradiction between faith, my faith and science. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have to believe that, you know, God is not one. Um, and I, I had experienced atheists who just did not want to see God in their science. But to some extent, more frustrating, I had also experienced Catholics who refused to see the, 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 the relationship between faith and science. You know, the two wings, as St. John Paul II describes mm -hmm. them um, in Fides ad Ratio. Um, so I, when I, when I uh, came to Franciscan, 
I, I'm, I teach primarily the research uh, uh, um, classes. And um, I was looking at the possibility of continuing my research, but the question was how? And the dean uh, of the, the academic dean, Dr. Daniel Kempton, mm -hmm. had encouraged me in this mm -hmm. regard to see if I could bring my expertise to uh, Franciscan with regards to the research that I did. And uh, it, it, I, I have to admit, in all honesty, it was in prayer uh, that I, I, I felt God calling me to utilize my uh, expertise in animal models of psychiatric disorders to investigate the question that has never been asked. What does abortion do at the purely physiological level? Especially given all of the arguments that exist you know, we have politicians that argue, we have psychologists, psychiatrists mm -hmm. arguing, there's literature in psychology uh, arguing. But as it, the, the aspect, when you're studying an animal model, one of the advantages that you have, there are disadvantages also. I don't want to make this sound like, you know, it's the perfect way. Um, but one of the advantages that you have is that you are, if you do your experiments right, you are doing the experiment independently of social pressure, uh, the rats are not influenced by social pressure. Uh. Um, you know, we were kind of joking about it earlier, but there's a truth in what I was saying. These rats are not influenced by by uh, the, the Catholic faith of our university. So it's a matter of setting up an experiment in the appropriate way to investigate, well, what does abortion do okay. at the purely physiological level? A question that was not really asked before. If If I may, why do you think it is that this question has never been asked in a scientific way before. Do you think that's an, a, there's an agenda behind that or just that it's so polarizing that major research institutions just wouldn't undertake that question? I honestly don't know the answer. What the, the suggestions that you're making do sound as a, like a possibility. Um, I, I honestly don't know what the answer is because Given, given what we believe in medicine, which is you hear probably a lot these days people talking about evidence-based practice. Well, why aren't we following the same procedure when it comes to something like this? Um, how many people would be willing to undergo a cardiac surgery if that cardiac surgery has not been uh, tested before? Mm. Uh, so why exactly? I do not know. But uh, it, it is very strange, given uh, the, like I said, the fact that as scientists, as med people in the medical field, we do depend on evidence-based practice, and part of that evidence goes back to uh, what is studied and investigated at the um, uh, preclinical level, because that's what these animal, uh, this is what these experiments will classify as preclinical experiments. This is fascinating that you took on this particular question. And um, because obviously when we look at abortion, right, it, it's a sin, right? It's obviously at a moral level, this is one of the worst possible things that humans can perpetrate is the murder of innocence. Um, but, it, and I think we lose sight of it oftentimes because the main focus is that it's an affront against God before anybody else. Before anybody else, mm -hmm. it, it is a direct affront against God. Then it is... A, direct affront against your neighbor, right? And we have these things that regardless of what the sin is that mm -hmm. we're talking about, mm -hmm. there is an eternal consequence, obviously, that take that will take place with if it's not uh, beg for forgiveness and, and, and have repentant souls for what they have done. But then there are also natural consequences and they stem from a, you know, a, 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 a uh, society that, it speaks the culture of murder and the, the society's morality devolves. Mm -hmm. And so you have other things that start cropping up, right? I mean, this is, this is a part of an effect of something. There's a chain reaction, but that you've taken it down to such a granular level that it, a physiological level that this can have a direct impact on us as humans, that God literally drills it down so far that, look, you cannot do this. There are look at all the consequences for the sake of your own pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. What are, what are the rats telling you when you induce abortions, abortions um, within the rats? Well, so uh, first of all, to define the abortion 
uh, the type of abortion that we're investigating. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the study investigates chemical termination, so the utilization of RU486, also known as mifepristone, uh, and then also the, with the addition of misoprostol. Okay. Uh, so that is what we're investigating. And just to give a brief explanation, um, mifepristone is the drug is an, a, a progesterone antagonist. This is something that blocks the effects of progesterone. Progesterone is a natural mm -hmm. hormone that is essential in maintaining a pregnancy. Okay. So with, uh, with mifepristone blocking the effect of, of progesterone, that's how you end up having the abortion. So it terminates the pregnancy. The misoprostol is administered in order to induce the contractions to expel the, the fetus or the embryo. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just wanted to make that to make that clear. So we're this is what we are investigating. And are, the, are these the two drugs that are in yes. what's commonly known as the blue pill, or is this something else? I, I'll be honest with you. I'm sorry. I, I'm not familiar with the or blue the, pill. Or the pill. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they. they with Matrix on we, you. We, <laughs> are, yeah, no. no, we're we're, we're no, red no, pilling no, here okay. on the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, the RU486. No, that, that the RU486 pill is what I think yes. Joseph was asking about. Okay, that's and that's me for okay. personal. Yeah. That's the gotcha. drug that okay. induces okay. the abortion. Okay. You, unfortunately, and I have to apologize for this, when you get so engrossed and caught into at this level of sure, research, yeah. you kind of kind of lose touch <laughs> with exactly how is the pill, Shorthand, yeah. uh, you know, what does the pill look like right. out there? Uh, so, yeah, we are investigating uh, chemical termination, uh, drug induced termination. Mm -hmm. And this drug induced termination usually takes place in the first uh, up to the uh, first trimester in the in the first trimester. OK. Period. Um, and that's when we are investigating it, although rat wise, the timing looks something somewhat different. I'll explain that in a, in a bit. Um, but what the rats are basically telling us is that, uh, drug induced pregnancy termination. So induced pregnancy termination, um, is, uh, in, induces negative behavioral effects, um, anxiety like depression-like behaviors in the rats, um, and even some physiological uh, changes that uh, actually persist for uh, many weeks in the rats and the equivalent of a uh, number of years in humans, actually. Wow. Um, so that, that's the basic summary of what we, what we see. I can go into more detail. If so if wish. I said it in layman's terms, you would just simply say that um, killing innocents shortens your life. Well, I, I don't know if I can say that in the sense that, see, this is you, you, this relates to the question you, you asked me mm. earlier with regards to what we can say with regards to okay. humans. Um, a, as a behavioral neuroscientist, I have to understand my limit. Sure. What, I'm see, what I'm seeing in the animals, and given the fact that those behaviors are behaviors that have been reported in the literature before mm. to represent depression-like notice. Also, I don't say depression behavior, but look for depression-like behavior. Those have been defined before, anxiety-like behavior. So that's that's why where I, I kind of take a step back and say, well, well, this is what my results say. Uh -huh. Do they have implications in humans? Yes, they do. That's mm -hmm. why we are investigating them. What will they cause for sure in humans? That I can't tell you. Sure. So in the rats, then, is there a measurable difference, uh, physiologically speaking, between a chemically induced abortion and a naturally occurring uh, termination to the to the pregnancy? In other words, a miscarriage. It's interesting you should ask that. We were. Um, Obviously, you can't predict, you can't plan natural miscarriages. Mm -hmm. However, we received a group of rats from the company we purchased our rats from, and they were naturally miscarrying, and we happened to be making similar measurements on them in certain aspects as what we were doing on the abortion rats. Okay. And the answer is no. We did not observe the same depression-like and anxiety-like behaviors in those rats that we saw in uh, in the... Uh, induced abortion uh, in the rats that had the induced abortion. We have thoughts in regards to why potentially the difference, and I can share those with you if, if 
you know, if you'd like. Well, well so what you're saying is that the uh, depression-like and anxiety-like behaviors in the rats are more pronounced in the abortive scenario versus the miscarriage scenario? I would go further than that. Okay. Technically, are present in the abortion rats, but not present in the rats that naturally wow. miscarry. So not pr not present. Wow. No, no, no. So one of the questions I've been asked in that regard was, I mean, we've had a miscarriage in my family. We've had a miscarriage. There, uh, the the second child um, was lost in a miscarriage, mm. and I mean, you know, that's uh, I think he would be about twenty one. And as a as a human being, I keep on thinking. We keep on thinking. My wife and I. You know, what would he be doing? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, this is how old he would be. What would he be doing? But we have that capacity to think back. Now, a rat doesn't. So what we are looking at is purely physiological consequences. Okay. When there is a miscarriage, as hurt, as much hurt as we do feel when we undergo, when we lose a child in a miscarriage, um, uh, the body knew that that life was not viable. Mm -hmm. That's why... The, the baby was unfortunately miscarried. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the case of a induced pregnancy termination, as the name implies, you're inducing it, but that baby is viable. Mm -hmm. That baby would have lived. And the body is capable of recognizing that. Mm -hmm. The body is capable of seeing that because the mechanisms that are involved in all of this are extremely complex. When, when a woman becomes pregnant, there are very significant changes that take place in her body. Actually, I should make that even more general. Mm. When a female, irrespective of the species, becomes pregnant, mm -hmm. there are very significant changes that take place within the brain, within the body, mm -hmm. in order to adapt for that baby, the, the new life that is within, mm. within the, with the womb. So terminating a pregnancy that is viable, the body is going to take that as a shock. Because it's going to be, be wondering, you know, I made all of these ad adaptations, changes, and where is that life? Uh, where is that baby? Could you induce uh, in, in, inductive reasoning? Could could you apply that to humans uh, as in, uh, within layman's terms, as mm -hmm. uh, s within the lower brain, so to speak, of a, of a human being, or the lower passions, or the subconscious, or wh how, whatever you want to define it as, that a woman who loses her baby her you're saying that her body already knew that that baby was not viable and therefore her lower brain is not surprised by it whereas it's a terminated baby yes. an artificially terminated aborted baby is is a shock to the to the lower parts of her of her brain again i would say it potentially is yes mm -hmm. i mean let's let me speak about our own experience okay our baby uh, we lost our baby savior at 16 weeks. Um, the reason why the miscarriage took place was the umbilical cord became twisted and was not receiving its food. So the, my wife initially saw some spotting um, and then we followed up with the doctors. Some spotting sometimes is appropriate in pregnancy, is okay in pregnancy, but this was brown spotting, which was not, not normal. Yeah. And we followed up with the doctor and you know, the doctor, then it was confirmed that this is, this, is what, this is what happened. So the body knew that life was not terminated by us. That life, the baby died because it wasn't receiving the appropriate nutrition. Um, and therefore, the, the body is aware of the reasons. Let's put it this way. And I don't talk about reasons in the high sense as we would talk about reasoning in humans. I'm talking about the, the physiological uh, steps that are taking place in the body that, uh, you know, it, it inv inform the body that the life is no more. Okay. That that baby, that baby's life is now not there anymore. It's not, you know, breathing. It's not feeding. It's not alive anymore. All of that is taking place in a natural miscarriage. Um, you, whereas that's not the case in a induced abortion of a viable baby. Goodness. Uh, so th this sounds like it's groundbreaking research doctor i mean i for, forgive me for being a layman but i'm i have not heard anything like this being studied or published by anyone else we are not aware of anybody else that has investigated this the one study that we found that looked at negative consequences of uh, pregnancy termination 
was a study conducted uh, way back in 1980 by uh, Russo and Russo, and they looked at um, uh, breast tissue uh, changes, changes in breast tissue mm -hmm. following midterm pregnancy termination, and they found negative effects in the breast tissue of the rats that had the induced pregnancy termination. In their case, they did it using a hysterectomy. They removed the uterus that had the babies mm -hmm. um, in, in it. Um, that, that's the, you know, one study that, uh, that comes to mind, but no, the parameters that we measure, the depression, like the, the anxiety, like behaviors and the physiological parameters that we measured, no, they have not been reported before. Now, I, when, uh, forgive me, when I think of, um, when I think of Franciscan university, I'm not envisioning like a major research institution, um, so it sounds to me like part of your discernment in, in moving to Steubenville was how are you going to be able to continue on this very important research work in, a, in an academic environment that is categorically focused on an instruction of students as opposed to like a research university um, that is more focused on you know, research dollars and grants and all these things. Is, am I understanding that correctly? That is correct to, to, to some extent. Franciscan University is primarily focused as a teaching institution. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, like I said, I mean, I've had support. I mean, the, the area of the building that is the lab where we conduct these experiments was obviously is within the university. So there's been support in that regard. And there's also some other biology professors conducting some other research in their field. But you're right. We are not a major research institution. So uh, when it comes to uh, conducting these experiments, I'm dependent generally on private donations and private organizations that will support mm. such research that is pro-life. Okay. Uh, and also on uh, uh, being uh, as frugal as possible with the little money that you get. Yeah. So, you know, being able to, I, I, I'm, I've, Thank God I've been blessed with experience setting up laboratories, so I, uh, even making some equipment. So if I can make a piece of equipment, which will cost me a third of the price, mm -hmm. I'll make it instead of buy it. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so it's just becoming being being very careful with your money and utilizing it to the best uh, best possibility to, to the best uh, poss in the best possible way. So, for example, we also uh, we maintain the fac animal facility. And we keep all our animals, all our animals are kept in the highest standard according to government regulations. Um, obviously, the ethical treatment of animals, uh, both from a, from a scientific perspective, is significant because if you mistreat your animals, then your results mean nothing. Yeah. On the other hand, as a Catholic also, there's the Catholic aspect and it's important for me to treat and care for my animals because that's what I am obligated to do mm. as, a, as a Catholic mm. also. Um, so we bre we actually raise our own animals in order to save money. And whereas it would cost us about, you know, 40 to 50 dollars per rat, in some cases, maybe even up to 100 dollars per rat uh, to, to purchase animals, we raise them for about 12 dollars per rat. Uh, we I have a research assistant that assists me in main, making sure that we do not inbreed. So we do not get any diseases. We kept us keep a strict line. Um, you know, making sure that we know who comes from who, whose whose mother is who, who is this, you know, rat's mother, who it's the, their father, um, so that we don't have any inbreeding and we keep a healthy colony that is uh, meets government standards, is inspected by a vet, mm. at least on a yearly basis, um, in, in order to save money and do things in the appropriate way. But well, $100 <laughs> a rat. I'm in the wrong line of business. I was just thinking that and I was... <laughs> Also kind of thinking that you are affording more rights and protections to your lab rats than this country affords to preborn human beings. Um, I, that irony can't, can't be escaped, I don't think so. No, it's, it's, it's interesting that you should actually bring that up because when it comes to the ethical treatment of animals, yeah. if you look at the, what the regulations state with regards to, the, to perinatal experiments mm -hmm. uh, so before and after uh, birth uh, it is interesting that the regulations refer to the animal as an animal before and after birth 
Yeah, mm-hmm. and of course, it, it's, you, not, it's, not a, are, it's not a blob. It's not a cluster of cells. And also, we are obligated to give the same amount of care to the uh, prenatal as the postnatal animal. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, really, the the only way to justify abortion is to uh, render the 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 being to be something less than human, because nobody really wants to support infanticide. No one really wants to support the killing of human babies. And so if you can just change their name and call them something else um, and and discredit their own humanity and take that away from them, then it becomes much easier to justify killing them, especially when they're inconvenient. So how, how, how do people support this venture of yours, Doctor? Uh, in general, it's through... Uh, private donations, like I uh, mentioned earlier, generally it's through speaking with people who become interested in what we're doing and mm-hmm. believe in the research that is being conducted. Because I also do have another project that is pro-life, uh, if, if you'd like me to mention that sure. aspect. So, and and uh, also, I'll finish responding to your question, um, Burst. Uh, also through uh, grant, a grant from the Watson Bowles Research Institute, um, as well as, you know, any assistance that can be afforded through donors that the university may reach out to. So that's basically the support. The other project that uh, we're investigating, uh, it re- relates to ectopic pregnancy. You know, when the, the, the implantation takes place outside of the uterus. Mm-hmm. We, at the moment, we do not have uh, uh, methodology, uh, set methodology of being able to save the baby at the moment those babies are aborted in order to save the mother's life Mm -hmm. so uh we are also investigating seeking to investigate a potential um uh, technique surgical technique uh for for the transfer of the embryo into the womb into the womb Uh in the case of an ectopic pregnancy so that is a very early investigation at the moment we are very in a very early phase um so we have those those are the two projects that i'm focusing on obviously the abortion study is not done uh the abortion study now moves on to the next phase and there's uh, one of which is investigating the neurochemistry so looking at what is going on in the brain mm-hmm. following the the, the abortion mm-hmm. and also looking at the possible the 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 effects of the administration of progesterone, uh, you, you, the, basically relating to the abortion pill reversal that Dr. Delgado and Dr. Harrison uh, practice, it's basically investigating that at the animal level in order for us to be able to uh, investigate better what's going on. What what mm-hmm. do we see the same behaviors? Uh, can we uh, prevent those behaviors that we reported in this paper that we just published? Um, so there's those aspects that we're still investigating. What has the reception been to your most recently published paper? And what are the major criticisms that uh, anti-life people are, are throwing at you right now? I'll be honest with you. I try and stay off the social media aspect as much as I can. However, I can tell you. Well, you'll be on YouTube um, now, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let it rain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what I've seen um, is uh, people who will, uh, they're not really criticizing the, the, the methodology. Uh-huh. There, there's no, asp- you know, they're not questioning the integrity uh, of the study. I mean, there's been, pe- there's been people who've posted stuff with regards to this is cruelty to animals. Okay. Mm. Um, I will make no further comment. I yeah. think you <laughs> yeah. get the idea. Um, so, but I've also, I have to admit, I have also seen, and I only followed the social media responses initially. Okay. Um, there's been, uh, some people who seem even, you know, to be either Catholic or Christian who have questioned, well, why do we need to do this in in rats Mm. and animals? No, why can't we just simply believe that it's wrong? I, 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 and to, to that, like I said, I, I emphasize the fact that if we believe that faith and science come together then it, it is it is on us to actually utilize 
uh, science to, to, to make arguments where we can. Mm -hmm. um, because it contributes to the evidence-based practice. Sure. And um, beyond, that, beyond that, I know that the journal website does keep tabs on the number of views of the paper. The paper has been viewed significant, a significant number of times in the past three months, significantly more than a number of other papers published at around the same time. I think we were close to about 5,000 views mm -hmm. in three months, which wow. is a significant amount. Um, it, it, the, the website itself of the journal is quite interesting because it also keeps tabs on, on where, which country, uh, w where people are accessing it. And there's people accessing it from across the world and mm. significant amount here in the States. Wow. Um, but yes, I, I do keep up the social media, um, not because I get offended at what people make say and the names I've been called, um, but more because I want to focus on the research. My, my, mm. my, my passion and also my goal, I'm a scientist, and I do not want to get caught in that bandwagon of, well, I need to respond to this. In fact, I've instructed all of my collaborators that uh, there are to be no uh, responses to the social media uh, comments that are made, positive or negative, okay. uh, so that we can focus on the science. Because ultimately, despite my faith, and I don't say that lightly, um, I need to remain objective as a scientist, and I need to ensure that the integrity, the rigor with which I am doing the experiments can stand and be questioned and appropriately mm -hmm. uh, responded to. The paper was peer-reviewed. Sorry, I I'm, yeah. would also want to mention that. Mm, so the yeah. paper was peer-reviewed, and the uh, reviewers came back with, uh, as reviewers should, uh, with some very nice comments, not in terms of nice congratulating us, nice in the sense of very useful feedback that help us, helped us improve the paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so for which we're very grateful. Well, it sounds like you're taking great lengths to defend the integrity of the scientific method that you're using um, and, to, and to ensure that nobody can criticize the, the manner by which you're arriving at your conclusions, which then just leaves people who will disagree with your conclusion to just disagree with the conclusion and reject it. They, they won't be able to argue the premises, but they might just reject the conclusion because they don't like it. It sounds like that's, that's kind of what you're going for. That is very, that's very true. And I mean, our hope is that this research, along with our research, what we continue to seek to do, we hope that it instigates more yeah. research, more questions. Yeah. I've always said that in you know the 20 or so years that I've been conducting neuroscience research, Every question I answer creates another 10. <laughs> That's the way it should be. Right. That's the way it should yeah. be. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for those who are out there in the audience um, and and who are very interested and passionate about this issue, Dr. Samud, I hope you don't mind me asking you, how much money do you need to raise to finish the finish this particular experiment and move on to your to your other experiment um, as well? So um, I'm looking in general at around $70,000 a year. And the reason for that is not because of the equipment, but primarily because I, I'm also employing the, a research assistant mm -hmm. and I pay for her salary and benefits as well. And that takes a substantial uh, chunk of that grant. And then the, the rest of it would be uh, the equipment that may be necessary to be purchased, uh, chemicals and drugs for the experiment that would be needed to be uh, purchase. So we're looking at approximately, you know, around seventy thousand dollars a year. That's that's the uh, kind of average. Okay. I, I'm a layman. I don't participate in uh, a lot of scientific experiments, but to me, that sounds like that sounds ridiculously cheap, reason right? reasonable. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. is. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, yeah, the the previous places. Uh, I I mean, I basically run. The, the the lab, so just focusing on taking care of the rats mm -hmm. here, because I do take care of the rats, um, it, on, on a, on a $5,000 budget. When I wow. said that to um, my lay colleagues who are running on a, you know, uh, a grant that is, you know, uh, 500000 over a year, over five years, so $100,000 a year, um, and it, it's, it, it, yeah, it, it's... I keep things at a low cost, yeah. and the, the costs that I'm talking about are 
realistically not that large compared to what is what goes so it sounds on. like you're an exceptionally good steward of your resources we are going to in the show notes list your website and how people can contact you and support your work but if you wouldn't mind telling us here live in the show um the name of your website and how people can can get a hold of you sure the best way of uh, the, the, the website that we've set up that reflects the research, so the website expands on the research on both projects that I mentioned, is samutlab.com, S-A-M-M-U-T lab.com. So Samut Lab is one word. Uh, in, on, that, on that webpage, we have information regarding publications, the, our publications so far. Re, I, my publications are up there, but so far regarding these projects, we only have one publication. Uh, we also have an in the news uh, section showing how this uh, uh, project has been covered. We also have a donation tab uh, where people find information pertaining to how they can make uh, donations to support this work. Uh, so all of that is on uh, samutlab.com. I can also, there is also a way of contacting us. Uh, my email is on the page that describes the personnel of the lab. So the lab assistants, the research assistant is there okay. as well. And our emails are there. And then there is a contact us section on the lab website as well. Beautiful. Well, listen, doctor, I know that you, father of five, you've got a lot going on. You have honored us and graced us by choosing the Living the Faith show to be your very first podcast and video cast with this important research. We hope to see you across the internet on other people's shows and that everyone can come together in the Catholic world and support you. We'll be praying for your work, Doctor. God bless you. And, uh, and keep doing what you do. Thank you. God bless you. Living the Faith Podcast. Brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. Restoringthefaith.com.